Tonight, we're going to hear from our faculty. So I'm going to introduce our very first faculty to read, which is our fiction faculty, Casey Platt. Casey Platt is the author of A Dream of a Woman, Little Fish, A Safe Girl to Love, the co-editor of Meanwhile Elsewhere, science fiction and fantasy from transgender writers and the publisher at Little Post Press. She teaches creative writing at Ohio University. And I am so happy to welcome Casey to the stage. Take it away, Casey. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Chloe. Can everyone hear me okay? This is I'm not too quiet or anything. Okay, okay, all right, amazing. Um, <clears throat> also to give a visual description of myself, um, I am a white transgender person wearing a black tank top uh, and, and a white uh, polka dotted uh, headband. I have big bright blue headphones on because uh, my old ones got uh, killed by the Toronto flood. Um, and I have my background is a pink wall with two art pieces from Sybil Lamb uh, behind me. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read from a short story um, that I've written called Portal. We're going to start at the beginning, so uh, no background needed. Everyone can still hear me okay? Okay, all right, wonderful. Amazing. When I first met Missy and began going over to the girls' house, before Nick and I started dating and before I moved him in with the girls, I went over one night and it was just Missy and me. She and I got to talking about relationships. She told me about her first online date after the most devastating breakup of her life. It was this girl in Detroit. They'd met online. She crossed over the bridge one Tuesday to go to her place for dinner. The girl, she talked about her life as a lawyer fighting health insurance companies. The girl asked her to bring over ginger beer. The girl apologized when Ben Folds came on her Spotify. Missy laughed and she was like, whatever. I still listen to him too, but if you tell anyone, I'll deny it. They had a nice dinner. The girl clinked a glass of sparkling cider with her. For some reason, they watched Garden State, of all things, and the girl was like, you ready to get sad? And Missy had a good time that night. She liked this girl. That's what she told me. And she said that halfway through the movie excused herself and came back dressed in old school pajamas, loose and navy blue cotton with white trim and white buttons. And when Missy left, the girl said, let's hug. And then she drove back over the bridge in a sea of 18 wheeler brake lights. The girl texted days later and said, I'm sorry, but I didn't feel anything. Me, I didn't ask Missy how she felt about this. I sort of feel bad now that I didn't, but I didn't. Instead, what I did was I told her about the liminal months after that boy in Edmonton revealed that he was cheating on me, the boy who was the most devastating breakup of my life and my life's main love. Still, something that is true even though it's been a decade since I met him and I'm now with another man. In that immediate post-heart-shattering period, the boy in Edmonton thought we could still make our relationship work. And strangely, so did I. It wasn't even like a like a, like a we can still be friends thing. Like Like what I'm trying to say is he thought we could still be together even though he was in love with someone else. And he hated the idea of polyamory. Don't ask me how it worked. The point is that I still lived with him for months, even though the girl he cheated on me with, well, she would stay over in our goddamn house. But most of my days just looked so placid during that time. I went to work, I got dinner, I came home. It's amazing what you can justify to yourself when the rest of your life looks normal. One morning I dropped him off at the sleep clinic because he was on night to the station back then. And I still had a couple hours before work, so I drove down the road listening to the lonely, the golden hour, and microscopic dots of snow were coming down. There was ice on the road, but no snow, and I didn't have winter tires, and I drove slowly, very carefully, and the neighborhood was completely still. The street was shuttered and closed. The remnant of the sunrise was a faint purple line. The clouds were light. The whole world was eggshell and sparkling gray. I drove up to the diner at the far end of the street. It turned out it wasn't open yet, but I wasn't bothered. I sat in my car idling, staring out into the trundle of rush hour, coming the other way before wheeling around to get a pin. And at that moment, at that moment, there was a woman sleeping in my apartment that I hated, despised even. And I was aware of this, but I didn't feel it. I felt light and secretive and soft. But what I thought, I thought things like, I love him. I thought things like, we're going to make it. Even now, I can feel how peaceful I felt that morning, even in the midst of betrayal and rage. There were so many evenings in those liminal months where I'd be at home trying to sleep and he'd have a night off and I'd hear them laughing and I would feel like I was dying. I'd be listening to a podcast in bed 
and she'd come in and say, she was so sorry, but could I possibly join my speaker down a little bit? That happened one day. He did nothing. I had a fantasy in that moment of getting up and throwing my phone right at her head and saying, get the fuck out of my house. For all I know, it had been the very night before that morning I dropped him off at the sleep clinic and drove back across the city in the icy late dawn light. Maybe it wasn't. But the woman who ruined my life was sleeping in my apartment at that moment. That I know for sure. It's not fair to say that she ruined my life. I know. I know that. But some things you can't shake, and some things aren't fair. At a certain point, it just is what it is. So, so Missy and I had told each other these stories of ours. The first night that she and I really talked, just us. Before Nick and I started dating, and before I moved Nick into the girls' house, and with this sad seriousness that was utterly genuine, Missy said to me, she was like, we're not going to have kids or families, you know? Like, this is what we have. We're what we have. That's why the girls have to be there for each other. And look, I get it. Yet despite my own situation, and despite however much Missy might have been accurately describing both of our lives, despite whatever truth in it was what Missy said, I could still only think, hey, bitch, speak for yourself. That's all, thanks.